Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening and welcome. My name is Ken McIntosh. I'm the presiding officer here at the Scottish Parliament, and it's my uh, real pleasure to welcome you to this, our debating chamber, and to celebrate uh, this important date, the 40th anniversary since the death of one of Scotland's leading intellectuals, uh, academic writer and political thinker, John P. McIntosh. And uh, over the years, John P. McIntosh has been described by many as the architect who laid the stones for Scottish devolution. And I can think of no further, uh, no finer venue uh, than our debating chamber for tonight's discussion. And in fact, um, I'm going on to say a few more things about his life and I'm going to introduce our distinguished panel shortly. But before I do, I wonder if I might just take advantage, I hope you'll excuse if I abuse my position, and just say a few words about John's personal influence on me. Because you see, John P. McIntosh and my own father, Farker McIntosh, uh, studied history together at Edinburgh University and they became very good friends. They were not related in any way, despite the names, but with a plethora of sons, fathers, and uncles, all called John McIntosh. Uh, John was known simply as John P. in our household. Uh, and coincidentally, some 30 years later, his daughter Charlotte, who's here tonight, and I ended up also in the same class at Edinburgh University studying history. So, and you'll hear from Charlotte later this evening at the reception. Now, I use the word coincidence, um, and we all know that Scotland uh, can be a village sometimes, but it, it is more than coincidence. It's not pure chance that I ended up as presiding officer here in the Scottish Parliament, an institution which John P. did so much to shape, but never actually lived to see. I have no doubt, for example, that my own father's support for devolution in the campaign back in 1978 and 1979 was shaped by his influence and his discussions, in fact, his many arguments with uh, John P. And the seeds of my own belief in devolution, in fact, not only in devolution, but in the whole idea of a new way of doing politics were laid at that very stage, uh, leading in turn to me standing for election to the first Scottish Parliament in 1999 and then again two years ago uh, as presiding officer. So I personally, I have to say, have much to be grateful for in the personal legacy uh, he left me. But for those of you who didn't have the good fortune to know him, a little bit about John's background. He was born in Simla in India in 1929. He first came to Edinburgh at the age of 11 and following the war, studied history at the University of Edinburgh before going on to read philosophy, politics and economics at Balliol College, Oxford in 1950. He then followed it up with a further postgraduate degree from Princeton in the United States. And although it was cut short at the tragically young age of 48, John's life was one of great achievement. He was chair and professor of politics at the University of Edinburgh, balancing his academic career alongside his duties in the House of Commons as the constituency member for Berwick and East Lothian. In addition to this, he somehow managed to find the time to write regular columns for The Times and The Scotsman and to appear regularly on television and also to give many public lectures. His ability to encourage Political debate, cooperation, and new ideas crossed the political divide, and there is no doubt about his influence on the thinking of people of all politi political persuasions and none. What's perhaps less easy to appreciate, perhaps without having known him, was his charm and attractiveness. John P. had a, a warmth to match his intellect, and I know from both my parents that John liked nothing more than a good old-fashioned argument, a robust discussion, welcoming disagreement, not for dis disagreement's sake, but as a way of exploring all sides of a debate. And of course, he was an early exponent of devolution and a leading, uh, sometimes lonely voice within the Labour Party for many years in the campaign for a Scottish Parliament. His ideas and writings have had a lasting influence. And as some of you may be aware, they're actually part of this very building. In fact, uh, every morning as I go up to my office, I step over his words. They're engraved uh, in the threshold to the Dewar Room. It says, People in Scotland want a degree of government for themselves. It is not beyond the wit of man to devise the institutions to meet those demands. So here we gather in the heart of the very institution that John P. McIntosh foresaw all these years ago to reflect on that statement. How we got here, but more importantly, where now for democracy, the theme for this evening's discussion. 
And as we get started, I take this opportunity to once again welcome you to Holyrood's debating chamber. I look forward to hearing from you, as many people as possible, during the question and answer session, and to uh, follow the contribution from our panellists. So thank you very much. I think if you can come down and join us. No, they're quite right. I blame the government. Yes, yes, yes. If you go one more... I blame the coalition one, government. One over Bally, that's if you can just go, really if you go one over here. Yep. There we are. There we are. Now, I'm, I'm indeed very pleased uh, to be joined by four very distinguished uh, panellists, Baron Campbell of Pitt and Weem, Catherine Styler, MEP, Professor Mona Siddiqui, and the Right Honourable uh, Angus Robertson, former Deputy Leader of the SNP. Uh, for those of you who don't know our panel, Professor Mona Siddiqui, OBE, joined the University of Edinburgh's Divinity School in 2011 as the first person to hold a chair in Islamic and interreligious studies. She also holds posts of assistant principal and dean at the university, as well as numerous visiting professorships at Dutch and American universities. And Mona is internationally renowned uh, as a public intellectual and speaker on religion, ethics and public life, who can often be heard in BBC Scotland and on uh, BBC Four, uh, Radio Four, including The Moral Maze, which I uh, tune into regularly. The Right Honourable Lord Campbell of Pitt and Weem, Ming Campbell as he's known to many of us over the years, uh, was Liberal Democrat MP for North East Fife from 1987 until he stood down in 2015. And during that time he was his party's uh, principal spokesperson on foreign affairs and defence. He was elected Deputy Leader of the Liberal Democrats in 2003 and served as its leader from 2006 to 2007. Catherine Styler is a Labour MEP and member of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. She has represented Scotland uh, in Europe since, uh, since 1999 and in this time has held many and varied roles from Deputy Leader of the European Parliamentary Labour Party to the Editor of the Parliamentary Magazine. She has also served as the Rector of St Andrews University uh, between 2014 and 2017. And the Right Honourable Angus Robertson is now a business communications and public diplomacy consultant, also serves on the advisory council of the Scottish Policy Foundation, as, being a member, as well as being a member of the Privy Council. But he's probably better known to most of us as the uh, deputy leader of the Scottish National Party, uh, the Westminster SNP group leader, and the MP for Murray from 2001 to 2017. And during that time, he was uh, the Foreign Affairs, European Defence and Security spokesperson in the House of Commons. So I hope you will join me in welcoming our panel this evening. Now, I'd like to kick off if I can uh, and, and begin already, if you can, to think of questions for our audience, uh, for, for our panel. But I'm going to start off, if I may, by asking our panel to just perhaps say a few words, a few reflections on uh, what John P's legacy means to each, each of our panel. And, uh, Baron Campbell, if I may start with you, because you knew John P. McIntosh. I think I'm the only one of the four, is that right? It's a sign of advancing years, I think. Um, uh, John McIntosh lit up the room, he lit up the um, lecture theatre, he certainly lit up the television studio. He was a very, very able practitioner as television and politics began to run together. Um, he was very determined, um, he very independently minded. Harold Wilson regarded him with great suspicion. And on one occasion, um, Harold Wilson said, to Willie Ross, whom some of you will remember as a very redoubtable Labour Secretary of State for Scotland. He said to Willie Ross, I think that chap Macintosh is after your job. And Willie Ross looked back to, back to him and said, not my job, Prime Minister, not my job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's a sense, I think, uh, of the independence that John had. I mean, he was never put on a select committee and he was never made a minister. And yet he had this enormous talent and, of course, he was trying to do three things at once, be the Member of Parliament uh, for Berwick and East Lothian, uh, be a good constituency MP, and, of course, to be the Professor of Politics in Edinburgh University. His determination was shown in the two elections of 1974. February, he lost to Michael Ancrum, now sitting in the House of uh, Lords as uh, Michael Lothian, but he won it back six months later. Um, and he was... One of these uh, sparkling people, we used to go to lunch, Sunday lunch, you had to prepare for it by taking a day off the day before. 
<laughs> and we're ready to take a day off the day after. And it would start around lunchtime. Uh, and it was always curry because he was born in Simla. So he knew how to make a proper, if you like, Indian, uh, Indian curry. And around the table, there would be unionists, there would be nationalists, there would be liberals. Uh, I even remember two Russian dissidents on one occasion. And the conversation would flow and the curry and the, and the alcohol would flow as well. And if it finished before six o'clock, he used to think that this was something of a failure. He, to call him a bon viveur would be to uh, treat him in, or, or, or to be too light a, a kind of description. But he was someone who lived a very full life. Uh, and there's only one thing about him which uh, David Steele talks about quite a lot. And that is he, he could leak like a sieve. I mean, you ain't seen nothing yet. The uh, political editor of The Observer was a woman called Nora Beloff. And it was alleged in London when he was in the House of Commons that uh, she, the, the two of them would have lunch on a Thursday afternoon, or Thursday lunchtime. Uh, and her column on Sunday would consist entirely of the leaks uh, which John McIntosh had given to her. And I remember in um, the period in the run-up to the first uh, referendum about De de for, on devolution, of which, of course, he was a very, very strong supporter. We used to have these meetings, uh, secret meetings, on a Sunday of what used to be called the Roxburgh Hotel in Edinburgh. And we'd turn up there, and we'd agree a program for the next five days, and we'd all be sworn to secrecy. And if you opened the Scotsman on Monday morning, <laughs> every detail was there. Journalists loved him uh, for that Surprise. very reason. And, of course, he was something of a journalist himself, because as well as academic writing, he did political writing as well. Indeed. He is much missed. We could do with him now. Indeed. Thank you very much, uh, I mean, for that very warm uh, uh, reflection. Um, Mona, I wonder if I could turn to you just um, both perhaps um, talking about what his legacy might mean uh, to you as, as an academic as well, uh, and perhaps some broader reflections on we're talking about we're now for democracy. Just wonder if you could lead into that. So... Um can I first of all say it's a, it's a huge privilege to be part of um, celebration of somebody uh, who is so significant their life and their legacy, uh, so thank you to the committee. Um, but as I was reading about him, I didn't know him, and I was reading about him, I thought, here was somebody who, from an academic perspective, really bridged the divide between academic and public life. Um, really had, I suppose, today I think politics has been reduced to administration and spectacle. And actually, politics should be about vision, and not just vision for your own life, but vision for what's to come after you. And it seems to me that by, in, by staying engaged in public life, by staying engaged in all forms of writing, not just academic writing, that you're making your vision accessible to a wider audience. And you're not always aware of the influence you're going to have and the impact you're going to have. And I think, again, from an academic perspective, I think most academics struggle. It doesn't matter what discipline they're in. How do you engage with wider, wider society? And I think that as, a, as universities are publicly funded, big civic institutions, we have a moral imperative to be more engaged. We can't sit on our laurels thinking that other people will sort life out. Other people will sort out politics. It doesn't mean that everyone has to be a politician, but politics is fundamentally about ideas. And if you're not interested in ideas that make the world a better place, then I think it doesn't matter what discipline you are in as an academic, you're not really doing your job properly. Mm. I think we'll return to a few of those ideas, including perhaps the difficulty between what's seen as public impartiality and balance mm. um, and taking a political interest, which I think is that difficult. Even if you didn't agree with devolution, um, the fact that there is a vision means that other people can be part of that debate. It's how you make that vision accessible, and, you, and people, can, people can resist that vision, people can argue against that. But I think if it's not about ideas, if it's not about imagination, then we have lost something in our public life. Hmm. Angus, I wonder if I just turn to you at uh, that point. Um, I, again, one of uh, John P's big um, ideas was this idea of sharing ideas across party. Yeah. Like me, you used to work for the BBC, so you'll be used to the idea that you know, we can have our own internal beliefs, but uh, uh, a, a, a public engagement on, on issues um, in, in an impartial way as well. 
Do you look at uh, John's legacy and see it in practice today? Well, can I start off by joining Mona in taking the opportunity to say thank you very much for the, the invitation to be able to sit in this uh, amazing chamber, which is a great legacy to, um, to John's um, vision. Um, and especially for the opportunity to take part as somebody uh, who's not of John's political persuasion. And I think one of the things that we lack perhaps in, in politics, or we certainly lack in the public being able to see in politics, is that often there is much that unites us, those of us in mainstream political parties. Uh, and that's why I think it's really important that when we have anniversaries such as this, where we can look at an over-dimensional contribution from somebody uh, that we can look back and we can uh, take encouragement from the things that, that John P. McIntosh did through his academic and his political uh, life and what he stood for and realize that that is something that we all share. And, and I think um, if we can remind ourselves about the values of uh, education, of arguing one's case on the basis of reason, facts, knowledge, uh, to debate in a respectful way with those whose views you disagree with, uh, of being fired by an internationalism, which I think, uh, like a stick of rock, goes through through John's life. I should say, I don't know if everybody in the, um, uh, in, in the chamber has seen this publication, um, but, but if you haven't, I would strongly encourage you to try and, um, is there somebody at the back who has copies of this? I'm looking around. Mm -hmm. If there is, please um, hand, hand it out to those who, who, who have not got it, because um, while Ming had the advantage of knowing uh, John, um, I didn't. Um, I was at primary school um, in the 1970s. Yes, Gratuitous um, remark. No, that there. wasn't gratuitous. You should be able to have a bit of fun whilst respectfully, <laughs> whilst respectfully debating, uh, debating things. But I, I think I'm, try I'm trying to make a serious point that um, when you have somebody who played such an outstanding role in our national life that was some time ago, I think the likes of uh, all of the, the annual uh, lectures that have taken place and now this new format however one does it, to be able to remind ourselves of the positive contribution of those who played an outstanding role. And one of the things that are reflected on when having a look at this book, I'm not on retainer, but uh, um, please everybody um, uh, put your hands on it, um, is the, the number of people of that generation of politics who died too young was one of the things that, I, that, that struck me so obviously John, but you can think of uh, Donald Dewar, you can think of John Smith, you can think of Neil McCormack. There are a whole host of people who still had years, if not decades, of being able to, to contribute to public life. And given the stresses and strains that we're now enduring in, in, in democratic politics, it's a, it's a huge loss to not have that wisdom to help show us the way. But my last thought that I would share is, um, we need as many people who are grounded in uh, academia and learning and knowledge uh, to help reflect the lessons of the past and make sure that we don't make the mistakes of the past again, uh, which is the, the, perhaps a bridge to some other contributions that panelists might want to make because John was clearly a polymath and exceptionally intelligent and we nor need more people who have a commitment both to social justice but also to uh, to learning and knowledge in public life. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we'll probably come back again to the subject of, uh, of learning and um, rational-based decision-making, uh, given the state of current democracy. I'm going to turn to Catherine a second. Can I just uh, encourage you, if you do wish to ask a question, make a point even, uh, just catch my eye, wave a, wave a hand or wave a, a leaflet around and just catch my eye, and I'll try and bring you in as soon as possible. Uh, Catherine, um, uh, John was very a very pro-European yeah. uh, MEP, so he, he left, me, left us many legacies. Um, can I just ask you, just before we go into the fact, I was just thinking, we've got through four contributions so far without mentioning Brexit, and I've just brought it up myself. But, uh, done it <laughs> before we go into that, I know, I can't believe I'm doing this. Before we do that, can I just ask you, do you have any, this is a terrible question, do you have any friends in other political parties? Yeah, what I do. a question to start me off with. Well, but the thing, the thing what I loved about reading about John, of course, I never had met him, and 
and it was the fact that he, you know, even in our, well, even in the Labour Party, it was Tam Diel that wrote, uh, organised his memorial, wrote the national biography in the, 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 in the Oxford uh, National Biography of, of, of John. And I think he had that ability to be able to work with people. And I think today, you know, our, our politics nationally, not in Scotland, just across the UK, is particularly horribly fractured in my mind just now. And I think somebody like him would have been able to bring people together in a way that other people can't. And there was no fearfulness of him. He wasn't, he wasn't scared about standing up for what he really believed in. And I think if he was here today to think about Brexit, he wouldn't mince his words, I think. I think he would be very, very clear that it's a disaster. We have to do something about it. And we have to work together to stop this from happening. Um, but I think that it was his tolerance and the fact that he could bring ideas. To he, but he, he not only brought his academic ideas, he also organised. So he created one of the biggest memberships of any local Labour Party, a legacy I think and believe is there today. And I see no Foy sitting in the front row here and that's part of that legacy. As an organiser, I call no Uncle No, but that's, <laughs> you know that. But, um, but the thing about that is that that's my connection, I guess, to JP, was that organisational ability that, that he brought and helped and inspired and led to the legacy that is still in East Lothian Labour Party. So return to the bigger issue yeah. of democracy. So just, I'll give you a few for me. I'm not going to throw statistics at you all night, but just uh, this part, given that we're in the Scottish Parliament, sure. uh, and that I think is a, is a direct legacy from John P. Um, at this last election, uh, we have uh, 45 female members out of 129, uh, two ethnic minority members, uh, and, of course, the 2016 election was the first time that 16- and 17-year-old voted for the first time. We, and our, our youngest ever MSP was elected, uh, Ross Greer, at the age of 21. Do you think that's a, a good reflection of our current state of democracy or actually just illustrates the challenges ahead of us? I'll come back to you in a second, and I'll ask Catherine I, first. I think that it's good to have diversity. It's important to have, but I think we can always do more. And I think that certainly in the European Parliament, we've now got younger women, women bringing their children into the, actually into the chamber. Um, and that's something that in other parliaments, I don't know whether that happens here, but in the European Parliament happens, is taken as, as read, partly possibly because we have a scandic element in our parliament and that's taken as read. But I think that in terms of if we want to keep up diversity within our democracy it's up to all of us each one of you in this room has a responsibility to uphold democracy if you want to stand for election stand for election if something annoys you put a petition together we all have to be part of it in the moment we feel very much that when you look around and you see all these books about the death of democracy and articles about democracy dying and we're at the moment in a situation where in many of our parties we've got extremes which are leading and that's something that's a great, great challenge to our democratic and liberal tradition of tolerance, of mutual respect and understanding where we can debate each other and come together as well as human beings. And I think that's something where, you know, somebody said there needs to be a bit more kindness in politics just now. And sometimes, you know, social media doesn't help with that intolerance that's out there. And some people who make amazing politicians just have that fearfulness of not standing and we have to encourage that. So I think we cannot take anything for granted in our democracy and it's up to each and every one of us to uphold those rights that we take for granted at the moment. Ming, I could see you wanted in on that. Do you? Yeah, I just wanted to add Robin Cook to yes. the heroes who have gone to political Valhalla, uh, who of course gave up his seat in the cabinet in order to make one of the best speeches ever made in the House of Commons, certainly since 1945, against the Iraq war. Um, we can't represent the country unless we're representative of the country. <laughs> and that's why it seems to me we have a long, long way to go um, in relation to parity between the sexes. And certainly by embodying a sufficient range of people from sufficient cultural backgrounds uh, that our parliaments look like the country. Now, I spend most of my time in London. I tell you, the House of Commons does not look anything like <laughs> what you see and what you hear in London, because London is now one of the most diverse cities probably in the world. And I think the parties have got a lot to blame. Hands up the parties. We've got this wrong. Our structures, the um, kind of encouragement we give people, the ease with which you can c come and join, all of these things uh, seem to me to stand in the way. Uh, and although um, uh, the former leader of the Labour Party now, I think, 
uh, regrets saying that you could join up for three pounds and have a vote for the leadership of the Labour Party. Nonetheless, that is actually a very good idea because what it suggests to you is that if you have a sympathy but don't necessarily want a membership of a political party, I mean, there are people, you, for me, used to deliver leaflets in Fife who would never think of joining the Liberal Democrats. But why should they be excluded from some of the major decisions in the party? Uh, simply because they did not want to become members. And so I think that idea is one, uh, and I understand uh, this is a, not a commercial, but Vince Cable's making a speech tomorrow, which has been heavily uh, trailed along those lines. We have to be much more uh, inclusive. And, and the other thing, I think, is that the... Uh, and I say this with some regret, but I think it, it, it's inevitable. The structure of Parliament itself... Um, there's always this stuff about um, men in, in tights carrying funny things over their shoulders and uh, all the form uh, of the uh, House of Commons, the language which is used, the nomenclature, all of that. I think we've got to face up to the fact that these are obstacles uh, and we should find ways of overcoming these obstacles. And the Scandinavian models yeah. are very, very relevant in all of this. And it seems to me we have to, we ought to have, if you like, for a whole variety of reasons, right? we're a, uh, a convention on the Constitution. But one of the first things the Constitutional Convention should do should be to examine the practices, and I don't exclude this Parliament either, <laughs> but to examine the practices of Parliaments uh, and to try and reach some conclusion as to whether or not if they were changed, they would not create a far more sympathetic atmosphere to those who want to be involved in politics. People say to me, Bill, it's not a question of people not being interested in politics. Good God, they're certainly interested in politics, but they're not interested in political parties, no. and that's our fault, and we should find some way of remedying it. We'll come back. Again, I encourage you to raise your hand if you want to come into this. Angus, I'll come to you in a second, Mona, but can, Angus, let's ask you about that, because political parties... Um, I noticed, for example, the papers this week, um, the... the the membership of the Conservative Party has fallen below the membership of the SNP, which is quite a remarkable statistic. But perhaps for the, there'll be a lot of people here who are very familiar with uh, political parties and how they operate, but many won't. Political parties themselves, I'm sure you recognise this, can exercise a sort of tyranny over their elected members, which you have to be careful about, which I'm sure uh, some of the elected members here will, uh, will recognise at the moment. There was an article in the paper last week about uh, Conservative members of parliament have been worried about UKIPers joining you know, interests in the m momentum or in the middle of possibly trying to deselect MPs. In the SNP, I'm aware that there's that dilemma the First Minister faces of whether or not she addresses the nation as the First Minister or the wishes of her party as the leader of her party. And it's a dilemma that all elected, official, uh, elected members have to. So do you recognise that democratic processes within parties can be tricky to get right to reflect the wider democracy? Well, um, the first thing is um, I would want to encourage everybody and anybody who cares about wanting to move things left or right, up or down, to get involved. I know as, as soon as you join a political party, before you know it, you'll be asked to be signed up as a local branch treasurer or social secretary, and that's, that's and beware, because that is, that is definitely a cross-party cross reality. Um, but I don't want to put people off getting involved, and um, in the SNP we had a huge surge of, of membership um, after the 2014 referendum, and that was people who had invested a lot of time and effort and hopes into an outcome that didn't come about in the way that they wanted to, but they didn't want to give up on politics, and they didn't want to give up on democratic change, and they didn't want to give up on what they believed in. Um, what is perhaps easier for the SNP is they were joining the political party not with a view to changing it fundamentally, which I, I don't want to go into the internal um, challenges of some other political parties, but that appears to be the realities uh, elsewhere of trying to change the way things are as opposed to putting one's shoulder to the, the wheel. Uh, to answer your, your question about political parties and how they work, well, politics, by and large, needs to be understood as a team sport. And there are rules, and there are rules in your local football club or your golf club or whatever you're involved in. Uh, and there are different cultures and different clubs about how all of that works. And I have to say, my, my experience within the SNP 
uh, is that it's a tremendously open organization to people who want to become more involved, do things differently, change things. Um, and that, that was borne out after the big surge in membership where there was absolutely no sense of here are the newbies who want to change everything uh, or here are the people who've been around for decades feeling pitut because there are all these newbies coming in. But can I just drop a little, a, a little pebble in the pond because we've heard Scandinavia prayed in aid um, quite a lot. And I think that's right if we take a linear view of how democracy and our institutions change, and we think change for the better, it should represent the public better, it should be more inclusive, it should involve those uh, who haven't traditionally been involved in politics. And that is, um, in, in large part, um, a development that has been led by Scandinavian countries. But the pebble that I'm about to throw in the pond is for those perhaps who've not watched what's happening in Scandinavia at the present time. We have a general election in Sweden happening in the next few days where uh, the Swedish Social Democrats have been in power for the, the best part of the last century are probably going to lose uh, the election uh, to uh, a populist right-wing party. And so suddenly our whole mental furniture about progressive politics, linear societal and political development is, um, is going to be questioned. Now that's not a Scandinavian challenge alone. Um, it's happened in Italy in the last year, it's happened in Germany, it's happened in Austria, it's happened in the Netherlands, it's happened in France. It hasn't happened here yet. And so my pebble in the pond, um, because is, this is the thing that we all, I imagine all of us are, are mainstream moderate Democrats, is how do we do our best to make sure that our institutions can grow and do all of the, the, the right things to reflect society as best it is it can, but that our political culture and our political debate uh, manages to effectively combat uh, the risks of, of, of the populism of the extremes. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's about institutions so much as the failure of what jokingly described as the liberal elite. Uh, I mean, I often ask myself, what does liberal democracy mean? And I remember going to visit a person who fulfilled this, this category someone who lives on the sixth floor of a high-rise flat, uh, unmarried mother with two children living on social security. What, what does being a liberal Democrat mean to a person like that? And I think we have allowed a, a sense of expectation to arise, sometimes it's called a crisis of expectation, of which name a problem, we say we can fix it. And the truth is there are a lot of problems that are very, very difficult to fix. Uh, and unless we can find a way uh, of converting the good ideas, like uh, f freedom of information, things of that kind, uh, into something that means uh, a great deal to those who we want to become more engaged in politics, and by that I mean the public in general, not the recidivists that want to go out on a wet Tuesday night in Pitt and Weem handing out leaflets. Unless we can find a way uh, of d demonstrating that when we make undertakings, we give undertakings, we do so in good faith, that we'll do everything in our power to keep these undertakings, and we will not abandon them uh, because it becomes uh, politically expedient to do so. I mean, the disillusionment is not with the institution, I don't think. The dissolution, disillusionment is with the people who are in the institution. I'm going to come back to you, Mona, but I just want to get, because John Hume Robertson, who is, of course, a successor to John P. McIntosh, in, uh, in the East Lothian seat, I believe. Is that right, John? Yes. Was indeed. <laughs> uh, you've indicated that you want to ask a question, and I, and I want to encourage everybody to ask questions, so I'm going to take you just to chip in if I can. If I may, I, I want to come back to Brexit, please, because I, I think this is so, so, so important. But, but you're just, okay, yes, you're right. I, I, I voted for John McIntosh. Uh, I, I first met him when I went to uh, an election meeting in the village of Paxton. Uh, down in sleepy Berwickshire, and I heard this guy for the first time, and I thought, wow, this is thrilling. Um, you know, he was talking about a parliament for Scotland, and it led to this. Uh, he was talking about European nations coming together in what was then called the common market and what became the European Union, and we've achieved that. So much has been achieved. I joined the Labour Party to support him, um, and... Yes, I often wish he was still here. Now, I could be still running a farm. But Brexit, I can just imagine what John would be saying about this issue just now, because we're talking about democracy here. 
And we're in a situation where we are being told that a referendum result trumps the principle of parliamentary democracy, the, sovereign, the sovereignty of parliament. Uh, that referendum result, okay, it was a simple majority for Brexit. I think it's 37.5% of the electorate voted for Brexit. Is that enough to justify running the risk of trade wars and maybe worse in the future? Is that enough to justify depriving my grandchildren of their European citizenship? Surely there must be some democratic way uh, of ensuring that Britain, preferably, and if necessary, Scotland, uh, remain in the European Union. But uh, I, I don't know what John would be saying about this, but it, it's, it's eating me up. Well, well, we'll definitely come back to that. I'm very conscious that we've got a panel entirely of Remainers here. <laughs> just so, uh, so I'm going to act differently. No, I'm not. Uh, can I come back to that in a second? Just because uh, I think the whole issue of participative versus representative democracy is important. And, you know, one does one trump the other. But if I can first, the issue of candidates, and I'd love to see that, you know, people come, came to hear me or any of our colleagues in the Scottish Parliament speak in Paxton or any other village hall and were inspired. I doubt that's the case, to be honest. You know, I really do doubt that. And, and John P., even in his own day, was exceptional. Most representatives are not great orators. Uh, but you said earlier, Mona, you, you'd like to see more academics. Uh, we, we've got Professor Adam Tompkins joined us, and I think across the board, People have welcomed that contribution, but he had to give up his job. If you hold down two jobs as a politician these days, you are almost certainly going to be savaged in the papers for it. So what, what hope is there? I th well, if I could just backtrack for a little, uh, for a moment. I think we're, we're focusing too much on chambers and candidates and elections as, sim as, as the reflection of democracy. And what we're really talking about is the threat to liberal democracy. You can have all kinds of forms of democracy. And so we're in a paradox, really, which is that if we, if we dispense with the liberal story, what are we going to replace it with? And I think, for me, and I, I imagine a lot of people in this room, the liberal story with, which most of us have grown up with, is, despite all its issues, is too precious. And it's precisely because people have lost trust in many of the wranglings of democracy that the liberal story itself is under threat. So it makes me feel, how do you hold on to what is good about liberalism when it's coming under attack? And it's not just about Scotland, and as you alluded, it's happening everywhere. And it's not happening everywhere because people are being forced to vote in another way. People are choosing to vote in another way. People are choosing to go towards populism. People are choosing to say, I'm going to vote with my heart rather than my head. I'm going to vote for what is good for me now rather than what might be good for the whole country in 20 years' time. And I think for me, it's, it's not really just about saying academics should be more involved. I think there is a way of... F the biggest problem for me in our political conversation nowadays is so many important things have been reduced to sound bites. And mm -hmm. you cannot have a proper conversation. I'm referring back to John McIntosh, you know, a liberal democracy must make room for the most feisty debates. If you don't have the feisty debates, you don't have a liberal democracy. That's what freedom means. But now we don't have feisty debates. We have name calling, we have silencing. And you opened up by saying, how do you get more people involved? Well, actually, the very fact that you have relatively still few women, ethnic minorities, or people who may be feeling very a certain trepidation, they don't want to be public figures because they don't want to be put in the spotlight. And, that's, and I think it's, it's happened quite quickly, but there's something about the nature of our political rhetoric now, which is less about ideas and more about identity politics, more about the fact that if I can silence you, I will, the fact that what you say I don't agree with, so it must be wrong. And I think you know, we blame what's happening in the United States. Actually, I think a lot of it's happening here as well that you're either with us or you're against us. And we've seen this in some of the debates around anti-Semitism, some of the debates around Islamophobia, that there is only one way to think about these things. And if you start telling people there's only one way to think about these things, you're not in a liberal democracy. Well, well indeed. Uh, and I think, I imagine a lot of people will share that, but isn't the problem that liberal democracy has failed so many people? I mean, it has failed. If you were to take a campaign like Black Lives Matter, 
or even uh, uh, trying to win the battle for gender equality. Or, or, or just recently, um, we've had a successful campaign here for, against period poverty. These are single issue identity politics issues that have been successful in a way that liberal democracy has not been successful. So do you, is, it, is it any wonder people are turning to identity politics? But I think the, the, the issue is that liberal democracy has almost become a victim of its own success by allowing people space to talk, to express themselves, to have freedom, to have access. I mean, if you think about what happened in the Middle East, people wanted a taste of freedom. That's what, and I never liked the phrase, the Arab Spring, because I always knew it would end up in massacre and blood and slaughter. But very, very quickly, despite the fact that people wanted freedom, people wanted liberalism, people also knew that actually, sometimes the rule of tyranny might work better for cohesion in society that actually you cannot, and it's in the nature of these societies. So everything that happens in distant countries affects us. Everything that happens here affects those. I don't think liberal uh, democracy has failed. I think what we need to be thinking about is how do we strengthen it in ways that are not necessarily more inclusive, because I don't think democracy succeeds in giving everyone equality. It, it succeeds when you make people feel that they are citizens who can be engaged in making citizenship better. People, if people don't feel a sense of engagement in politics with a small p, people don't feel a sense of engagement in how can I make my life better as well as those around me, then they will become disillusioned. And at the moment, because people are disillusioned with politics with a big p, they're looking after their own interests. In the middle of that, you touched on a couple of, of behaviours that go with identity mm -hmm. politics, including this uh, this idea that you're not even allowed to hold an alternative view, and that's often manifested in, in no platforming sure. uh, people. Can I just ask either Catherine Angus or in fact, and Campbell, if, if have you ever been in a situation where you have refused to go on a platform with somebody, or been tempted to? Because I, I know that it, it was it was a pot potential for me at the last election. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we were going to have an uh, extremist candidate. And it didn't happen in the end, but it was, it was a real dilemma. So do you go on or do you not? And it is actually an accepted behaviour now that you don't. You don't share a platform with people from the far right. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Catherine? I think it's a difficult one, isn't it? But I think that the thing about sharing a platform with, a, with an out-and-out -out fascist, I would certainly have a real challenge with. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the European Parliament, we have a, a group that are fascists we have the national front from france and we've got you know that group there and um I, I, i'll just give you an example I'm, I'm about to chair the icelandic delegation and one of the people on that delegation is from the enf that's the french fascists yeah. and you're kind of like should i even be chairing a delegation yeah. with a french fascist there and this is a, is a dilemma now i i think we still should have the icelandic delegation and she's chosen not to speak so that's the decision but it is a hard choice to make within a parliament where there is a recognised group. Mm. I, think, I think it's very, very difficult to, to uh, draw up uh, red lines and try, uh, and try to get... I mean, I think I would refuse to share a platform with someone who did not subscribe to freedom of information, the right to assembly, um, uh, recognition of diversity. Um, I mean, all that... I'd, I'd refuse to... Um, share a platform with someone who would abuse the very right to be on the same platform as me. You see, I'm not putting it very elegantly. But the point really is that, uh, and, and, and if you remember the question time uh, when uh, Baroness Varsi yeah. took, uh, what was his name, Griffiths? Yeah. Took, yeah. absolutely, yeah. took him to pieces. And if ever there was an occasion when it was right to share a platform, uh, because you had an extremely eloquent uh, person on the other side, so far as he was concerned, uh, you had a very sympathetic audience, uh, and in the end, he was pretty, he was a very poor performer. So everything, all the, um, uh, the ducks were in a row in, in order to ensure that what I thought was the right result uh, c came about. But I don't think um, I would be willing to share a platform with someone who did not subscribe to what I regard as the very fundamentals of democracy. And here's an interesting question. You've got people now like Erdogan who get to power using democratic means and as soon as they're in power, what do they do? They start to haul up the ladder. Yeah. They start yeah. to destroy the very democratic system 
mm. which allowed them to triumph. Mm. Yeah. Now, how you deal with that, I think, is a very, very difficult question. Angus, before you come in, I could hold that thought, because I've got a person at the very back there and another person here. Yes. Um, David Birrell, uh, when we came in this evening, uh, we were kindly reminded to turn off our devices uh, because it interfered with the sound system. And of course, that's just another example of the digital revolution in which we're living through. And when there are things like soft power, social media, data analytics, in many quarters, the argument would be that so far, the greater use of these tools has been disruption, distrust, uh, distorted diplomacy. So in all the great ideas, and, and of course, there's going to be violent agreement of the things that we want for the future, my question to the panel is, within the context of the new digital revolution, which is no longer uh, a choice, it's part of who we are and what we do, how do we reach or deliver a lot of these objectives in that digital world? Okay, I want you, panel, to think of that while we hear the other, the lady just there, yes? I was thinking about Kenyan right um, when I was listening to some of the comments earlier um, and I think Ming's comment in particular about Westminster because this is a parliament that's 19 years old. Um, I was comparing it to my 19 year old son and saying it's still a child really um, and it's got a lot to learn and, and a lot to do but I remember Kenyan saying the one threat it could offer is the threat of a good example to Westminster um, and I rather like that. But coming back to the other point about Brexit, I heard Ken Clark speak at the COSLA conference last year and he made me realise that if you were to count of the 650 MPs in Westminster, the vast majority are in favour of remaining in the, the European Union. And yet they seem to have forgotten that once they get there, their job is to do what is best for the country and best for their constituency. Coming back to the Scottish um, context, the one thing I was thinking, and Mona's point about engagement, this parliament signed up to a participative approach to things. And I remember Susan Deacon challenging me early on and saying participation's not enough, it needs to be more. And I can remember when we were selling the idea of this parliament, we used the information that this is the most underrepresented country in Europe, and it still is. And I think the real answer to the disaffection we've got here isn't just about more engagement, it's about that principle, I hate the word, of subsidiarity and beginning to push the power that sits here further down into local government and into local communities so that people can feel they have power and control over their lives, not just engagement in a process that happens in this building. So I'd like to think as we come of age as a parliament, that will be the focus going forward. I noticed by the way, Susan's sitting two seats in front of you in the row. <laughs> Uh, Angus, I asked you to hold a thought there, and you can uh, bring it back up and pick up on either of these two points if you wish. I will, and I pr probably won't do justice to the questions that have been just um, have been raised. But I just wanted to throw another pebble in in the pond um, about the, the nature of the threat to democracy as we face it. It's not by well, it's not necessarily by people uh, wearing uniforms and jackboots as it was in in previous decades. It's by people who are. Uh, in many respects, more, sadly, more intelligent than that and realize how they can subvert the democratic process by um, positioning themselves in an electoral sweet spot which doesn't see them banned because there are countries that have very, very strict laws against political mm. extremism, Germany and Austria, two examples, where it's a criminal offense to deny the Holocaust, it's a criminal offense to use the symbols of the 1930s, it's a criminal offense uh, to, um, uh, to question the uh, existence of a constitutional state. So they're clever enough not to be there, although they believe in much of that, and they are campaigning on the issue of the age, which is uh, rocket fuel uh, in many countries, which is the issue of immigration. And the difficulty for the, the mainstream liberal elites, as, as Ming rightly described uh, many of us as we are, uh, is that we, are, in whatever the countries that we've been mentioning, are not able to assuage the concerns that people have. And the irony of all ironies is where these messages are most powerful are in the areas where immigration is lowest. So the highest level of support for the AFD in Germany is in Saxony, which doesn't have a problem of immigration, as a problem of emigration, internal emigration within Germany. 
Um, you could say the same for Brexit. Communities in the north of England where levels of, of immigration is very low, but if you ask what the motivations were of people voting for Brexit, it was to kick, kick the system and all that and all that, and the number one issue uh, was immigration. So my point about the challenges of the populist extremes is that we need to understand the level of threat that we uh, face, which segues into the, uh, the challenge of, of social media and such like, which I don't want to overstate because I think on the one hand there is a democ democratization of information and access to information. We think of things like Wikipedia, which is a fantastic resource. It's excellent if you speak to, and I'm glad that there are some young um, um, students of, of school age in, in, in the audience who I'm sure will attest to this, uh, of the ease of being able to research and work and learn. It is at your fingertips. That is a great thing. Um, but what is going on in the darker recesses uh, of social media, of the dark net, of what's happening with the internationalization of political extremists working together and seeking to subvert uh, election results, subvert referenda. It's not just about the near state actors in Russia. Uh, it's about the coalition of political extremes. Uh, if you look at the top 20 hashtags in the, the German election last year, seven of them, seven out of 20 were generated from alt-right sites. And that is the level of the involvement of the political extremes. And I think part of the challenge that, that we face is that many of us, to a certain extent, and I include myself in a plea, so I'm not trying to attack anybody, is that we are, to an extent, we have been operating in an analog political system using analog structures and analog thinking uh, at a time when politics and democracy is now in the digital age. And the, the inter um, generational gulf between people involved in politics and a younger generation is larger than any gulf that there has been um, in recent times, if ever. And so that's, I suppose, a wake-up call for all of us um, older folks looking at the younger ones in the, in the audience, because we really need to get our head around what does that mean. Uh, and this shift is only going to accelerate and um, Moore's law t tells us that. So, uh, Angus, in, in the American elections, it wasn't young people on social media that the problem was. It was over 60s using Facebook and believing everything that they read. Mm -hmm. That was not my analysis. Mm -hmm. of the Knight Foundation that looked at what happened in the American elections. And I think with technology, how we solve the problem of where it becomes echo chamberish and where it becomes aggressive. I mean, the only time I've ever had to go to the police on a social media issue was when it was an e-cigarette campaigner who kind of threatened me. So it's very interesting how you can end up in situations. But, but what I would say as well about technology, this also leads to us why people, and what Mona was saying about people, why the public are so disillusioned at the moment with politics as well as being interested. If you think that in the 80s, and this is, a, this is an American statistic I read about yesterday, that um, over 50% of the population in the 1980s either worked in a factory or in some clerical work. Come 2016, that was 15%. The change that we see with technology, and it's going to get greater. And I don't think as politicians we've got the answers to what the AI revolution, AI is just uh, you know, the data science, people talk about AI, but it's about the data revolution of what that means for us and where that takes us. We are not giving the answers to these big questions that are out there. And I think that is also a responsibility to not just how we use technology, but how technology is changing the world that we're living within. And you're right, we're going from an analog to digital age. We're in this revolution that we're really only coming to terms. We're not really coming to terms with that, actually, because it's, it's changing all the time. So I think these challenges that we face, we have to have political answers. And I'm not sure whether any of the political parties are really answering those key concerns. And that leads to fearfulness as well, because there's so much change. Mm. I worry that they're, sorry, I actually worry that they're feeding it, not, not just answering it, but feeding it. I want to just to say that power now mm. lies in big data firms. People who have access to our, knowledge, to our data have huge power. And we don't know the cost of that yet, because Technology and uh, algorithm and that whole world has come to us really without too much of a struggle. It's come to us and made our lives easy in so many ways that many of us have embraced it and not thought about what the long-term costs of that might be. Not just about looking at your phone too much and things like that, you know, the, the influence on children, etc., which are serious issues, but I'm talking about more globally in terms of shifting paradigms. Um, but I do think that 
just following on from the immigration thing, when I was chairing um, the Scotland Strong Green uh, campaign, when I went to the meeting in London, they would always say to me, oh, economics is the big thing. And I would always say, no, it's not, because mm -hmm. people will vote with their hearts on this. Um, you tell people, you know, big banks are saying this, people don't care, they just care about what's going to be in my pocket. <coughs> and people did, to a large extent, vote with their hearts. But I think that the whole issue of immigration in Europe is really about Europe's own soul-searching. Not just reduced to what does the EU stand for, but actually it's becoming easier and easier to say to Europe, because in some ways, you see, a lot of us think history is this linear process and that we're living in a world of technology and progress and advancements. But for a lot of people, they're still living in the past. They haven't mm. forgotten their history. They want to be in a position where they think, I know where I belonged, I know what I believed, I knew what family life was, I knew what my community was. And even if for a lot of us, we can say, well, actually, that's not really what it was like at all. You're imagining this because you're playing into the hands of people who want to make you think like this. I, I don't think this is a problem that's going to go away. Mm. Even if immigration is reduced and characterized to get votes, I think people have, a lot of people, including in the UK, have some deep-seated seated res reservations about what does immigration mean for our long-term future. And when they say immigration, we don't really know who are the immigrants. The people who are, who've been here for a year, the people who've been here for 40, 50 years, anyone who's not white. Mm. And I think it's these issues which we just don't discuss in public life. Mm. Um, and I think they do need to be, because I think while we're not discussing them, a lot of people are increasingly feeling unsettled. And when you feel unsettled, then you become prey to all kinds of ideologies. Yeah. I think I'll come back to you a second, but I want to bring in, there's three members of the audience caught my attention. There was one, yes, yes, the man in the front row with a beard, and then the man at the back row. Man in the front row first. Oh, yes, a microphone, and that's even better. Thank you. Uh, isn't disillusionment with politics an inevitable consequence of having to pick the lesser of two evils in a first-past-the-post system? All right, so voting systems could be partly to blame. Can you pass the microphone back, and I'll just hear from uh, John in the back row up here. Sorry. Yes, say Maureen. Yes, because you've got a microphone on your desk. We make your point. And, uh... Thank you very much. Um, I feel um, rather hesitant to uh, trespass on this territory where we've had such um, remarkable contributions from all the, um, the panellists. I'd like to pick up on one thing in particular. In his characteristically thoughtful contribution, Angus reminded of something which I think is so often forgotten. Um, and he reminds us of um, the wider common good. Um, it's not just about Britain, but it's about um, the wider European Union. And in reflecting on um, some of the rather distressing things that have happened um, in elections um, on the continent, we might um, not feel so secure in this country because we have an electoral system which doesn't tell the truth. And in fact, um, we might ask ourselves where these um, right-wing elements are submerged as far as um, our parliament is, um, is concerned. But what I am concerned about, if we talk about liberal democracies and social democracies, reminding ourselves that perhaps that the European Union is first and foremost about political and social justice, not about economics, it's just the engine. It belongs in the engine room, not on the bridge of the ship. Um, but what we tend to forget, of course, is that um, those of us who are socially progressive tend ourselves to become part of the elite. And there's a tendency, in fact, I think, to forget those people who've been left behind and unwittingly would become part of an unforgetting um, new um, ruling class. And I wonder if that might not be some um, um, indication of a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think this echoes very much um, mm. John P's um, contribution at the time, that he was very concerned that politics didn't exist in an intellectual vacuum. Indeed, which is the very point Ming made. I'll just hear the chap at the very back first, and then Ming. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, I'm uh, honoured to be a, a close colleague of Charlotte Barber, um, John P's daughter. And um, I 
turn the question around that several of you have posed for the panel, that how could this remarkable man have worked so successfully and effectively across several branches of politics before the internet, really before the internet existed at all, and uh, before um, there were uh, 10 different news channels, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, with the same news with a different slant on it. Uh, there, were no, there was no Twitter, there was no um, email. Uh, and he influenced opinion, I think, perhaps partly through his university work. He, he was obviously a top-class constituency MP, and he, he achieved politics the way it was designed to happen. It has been grossly abused, especially by one gentleman who is now under a lot of fire this week about his Twitter and everything else he does wrong. But, but John P. set an example, and I think we should look back at how he got it all so right, this kind of democracy and his politics, <coughs> and how the world is crumbling around us with all these appalling um, over overuse of the new technology that is making it so complicated. Uh, thank you. Ming, can well, I just ask you to bring up? The fascinating thing is it's all in here, because not only was he highly talented, he was extraordinarily industrious. For example, he wrote his lectures out in longhand, and the archive, apparently, to which there's much reference in this document, is still available to look at. And it was that industry plus talent which made him so successful. But can I slightly take issue with this question of economics? Uh, if you were a steel worker in Ebervale who lost your job, or an auto worker in Detroit who lost your job, then there was very little, if age 50, say, there was very little to look forward to. And if you consider heavy industry, taking Scotland, steelworks, coal, shipbuilding, hard work, but there was a pride and a sense of status among those who took part in these industries. And if these are all swept away, then you get left with a whole generation um, which feels that its purpose in life has been taken away from them. And that, I think, is a lot to do with the Trump phenomenon, because in the Rust Belt uh, and um, in the, uh, across the prairies uh, and in the Deep South, there are large parts of that great country, America, with the biggest economy in the world, where poverty is self-evident at every step and where the kind of traditional ways of earning a living and having status in the community have been swept away. Uh, and that comes back, I don't think anyone's used the word yet, globalization, but we've mishandled globalization because globalization had a wonderful capacity for doing good, but we did not understand that if you were giving effect to these technological changes which have been discussed, you had to find a way of ensuring that everyone came along together, that but people think, weren't left behind. But I think in a way, you're answering the question, which, which is what I was trying to say, that when people feel left behind, it's very easy to then prey on people's fears. And so you're being left behind not because steel industry vanished or because shipping vanished. You're being left behind because other people have come and taken your jobs or because you're not qualified enough and there's a whole liberal elite world out there. I mean, I don't even like that phrase because I don't know who are these liberal elite. But anyway, uh, there's a whole world out there that's just taking all the opportunities and you're being left behind. And I think working on people's fears is really potent. Um, politicians do it as well. But I think what we're seeing now is that it's becoming easier and quicker and faster to work on people's fears because language is being translated and transported in thousands of miles and seconds. And so the same thing may have happened with the Trump election, but I know lots of people here in Middle England who are not left behind who voted Brexit, mm -hmm. who are not, you know, I have had people say to me, how dare they tell us the shape of our bananas? That's why I voted Brexit. And I, no, but I think but I didn't know whether to laugh yeah. or question or take the woman seriously. But then I realized that this person was reflective of a whole neighborhood of people who voted Brexit for those reasons. And you know how these but not people who are left behind. They're well off Middle Englanders, not all English, but a lot of them. And they just didn't, they wanted their sovereignty. They, 
goes back to what I was trying to say, which is about people having this nostalgia for something, people or even misreading history. Whether it's true or not, it's very easy to say to people that life was better when we didn't have this. Before I get, no, before just, I no, uh, no, so wait a second, I'm just going to just bring, I want to bring Catherine as an MEP here, just to defend, because to bring about a democracy, the expression that's often used about Europe is democratic deficit. And the very point, so retaining sovereignty, questions about you know, the EU, faceless bureaucrats imposing things. Like this. These are questions about democracy. Even Trump himself talked about draining the swamp at Washington. They focused on democratic representation in many ways. So isn't the lack of democracy in Europe part of the problem that people are actually addressing? But we've increased democracy in the European Union. And, where, you know, and, and, and this is, this is the, the, the deep sadness that you've, you find about where we are. I mean, why was the European Union created? It was created to make sure that countries didn't fight each other. Exactly. It's the most successful peace process that the world has ever known. It's not, all, it's not about bananas, it's about peace. And how did we, over 40 or whatever years, how did we not have that conversation in our country? It's all parties have, have, have been, you know, what they did was you Europeanised failure and nationalised success for all the time we've been a member of the European Union. And sadly, we are now where we're at because it took three words to sell that anti-message, take back control. Take back control of whatever you want to put in front of someone. And that's the tragedy we find today where we're going to leave our most important trading partner where so many people's jobs rely on that trade for we don't know what. I mean, we're what, seven months away from that 29th of March mm. and still we don't know what the mm. government wants. I mean, I cannot believe we're in this situation. And I don't believe many Leave voters also want to be in this situation. That's why I really now advocate a people's vote, because you have to have something on what deal another, is going to be referendum. struck. Yeah. Sorry? I, another referendum. I do. Would I you, absolutely unequivocally think I, we need to have a vote on whatever the deal is. Okay. Absolutely, unequivocally. Can I ask you, can I, can I ask you this question? <laughs> you know, can I ask this question? Would you, you, would you like another vote on Scottish independence? Two different, I've, I've thought about this, Ken, because I thought people who, you know, we're talking, we're not talking about apples and pears here, we're talking about two different things. What has happened with Brexit, and now we're seeing, I signed a letter which was saying we should legally challenge what the Leave campaign and the money that's been used. We need to look at what is happening. Our government is about to take us to a cliff edge, take us into a situation that's in nobody's interests. You know, nobody, the, the poorest people in our country are about to be the hardest hit by this decision and those that the well well off people in our country can walk away and not be touched or damaged by this this is unacceptable absolutely unacceptable is it not democracy Do, well what, what, what could be more democratic than putting something as important as this to a vote? We already have. We voted for it. Yeah, and we've voted. But, but, but it was a rotten but, campaign. Both sides of the campaign. Yes, greatest, it, it, Angus. With the <laughs> greatest respect, in this country, we didn't vote for it. Exactly. In Scotland, 62% voted um, to remain in the, in the European Union. <laughs> and can I... Angus, um, can I just, just make a point about that? Because I think it's quite interesting re to reflect on why that is. One of the reasons why I think that Scotland voted significantly and strongly to remain in Europe is firstly, we had had a narrative over 30 years that Europe brought something positive. We could see it. We could see it with the roads that were being built in the Highlands. We could see it with the investment that there was in this country, point one. So unlike um, the rest of the UK, where there was decades worth of Daily Mail um, and um, extreme Eurosceptic arguments ag against Europe. That was not the, the case here, observation one. Observation two is that I'm actually hard placed to think of a single person of significant public standing in this country that was in favor of it. It doesn't matter what party you were in. Uh, across the political divides, uh, we had overwhelming support for remaining in the European Union. As far as I'm aware, we only had one person actually elected on a Eurosceptic ticket on any level of governance in Scotland. And then perhaps uh, the odd parliamentarian who I can't even remember or name. So we had leadership which was making the case why membership of the European Union was important in Scotland. And we now have to ask ourselves, and this goes back to, to John uh, Hume Robertson's point, uh, of what do we do now? Uh, and I think we really, really have to think very carefully about where we are being dragged. 
because whether you voted yes or whether you voted no in 2014, you will remember that if you were being persuaded to vote no, it was on the basis that if you voted yes, we would be outside the European Union. And what happened two years later, we are being pulled out of the European Union when we didn't vote for it. Now, I'm sorry, that is not normal in a normal democratic country. And this poses a real challenge to those pro-Europeans, many of them in this room, uh, who were not persuaded in 2014 about the case, and that's fine. Uh, but we are now a few years down the road and we are facing one of the biggest challenges to our social and economic well-being and a challenge to our sense of, of democracy given that we voted to remain in the European Union. We were being promised we were being promised we could stay. Do you remember this? We could be in Norway. Do you remember that? We could be in Iceland. Okay, we were exactly. told all of these things, and I'm not even going on at length about £350 million pounds a week for the NHS. We, we don't want to rehash all the, 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 the result was based on a lie. And we voted to remain. So the question is, what now? Will we just accept it or not? Can I just say that these are, I mean, I, I know that everyone is infatuated. We are all, uh, we need to resolve these issues. Tonight's discussion is really about democracy, yeah. if I may put it that way. And maybe we won't resolve the Brexit one. Uh, Angus, I want you all, if I can, as a panel, to think of your concluding remarks because the reception is waiting for us downstairs. <laughs> and I hope that will hurry up. Uh, and Angus, I wanted you to think of one thing. We talk about democracy, and you said that um, we didn't vote for it, but the vote was a UK vote. And, and I think you're suggesting that we should have a selective democracy. So we only accept the Scottish part of our UK vote. So I'll just, just ask you to come back on that issue. And I'll have one last contribution from the audience just here. On that John P. McIntosh was a very independent-minded individual. And I'd just like to ask about what his view was in Parliament of the views of the whips. And we talked about the tyranny of the party, but is there also an element of the tyranny of the whips? Um, because I think one thing that may be uh, putting younger people off getting into politics is that maybe they think their own view matters, but actually once they get into Parliament, they're actually told there's not just one way to think, but there's one way to vote, including on critical issues, Brexit among, amongst them. So I just wanted to ask the panel maybe, could they imagine, would it be complete carnage if everybody had a completely free vote on everything? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm interested to hear that uh, because I think we've all had different dilemmas on that over the years. I wonder if I could just come back to the panel then just for perhaps some, some concluding thoughts. Um, if I could start with you, uh, Ming, just because if I may say so, um, I think the Liberals tend to be uh, less whipped can I put it that way, than other parties? Am I right in saying that? Well, but if you become a party leader, uh, then I can tell you how important the chief whip <laughs> becomes. So I have to, I have to make that concession. Um, I think you could find more opportunities when there sh should be free votes. But I think if you're faced with a real choice, for example, um, the Labour Party's position, as I understand, Mr Corbyn, is to nationalise the railways. Uh, now, that involves necessarily, a, you can't partly nationalise them, or it involves a real binary choice. And on that basis, then, I find it very difficult to see how you can conduct parliamentary democracy without having a whip system. Uh, now, the problem, of course, is that uh, it's the nature of the system which is often so offensive. I mean, it's alleged... Uh, all three, or, all four of them have got black books in which they write down the peccadilloes of their um, um, members. And if a difficult issue comes up, they say, well, mm, would your wife like to know about this? Or the fatal, the, the, the absolutely fundamental one for the Conservative MPs was the chairman of your local association and his wife like going to the Royal Garden Party every year. Um, would they like to be told that they're not able to go this year because you've been rather unhelpful for the government? Mm. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of skullduggery of that kind goes on. And I think that's what gives the whipping system as much of a bad reputation uh, as, it, uh, as it undoubtedly has. And some of the methods used are pretty awful. And indeed, the system does not always stand up because, of course, the chairman of the Conservative Party had an agreement with Joe Swimston who was on um, uh, maternity leave, that they'd be paired. And what did he do? The chief whip twisted his arm and he went and he voted against the 
gentlemen's and gentlewomen's agreement that had been entered into. So I think it, is, it, it, it has a role, but it should not be as determinative of events as it is. Angus, come back to you. Um, you were a group leader at Westminster as well, so, and, and deputy party leader. Did you have to exercise the whip? Well, I, I, um, I've watched House of Cards as well, and I'm, I'm aware of the, uh, the stories about black books and, and all of that. I, I have never seen that in the real world. I, I don't doubt that it happened um, in, in the past. Certainly didn't happen on, on my watch. But <clears throat> herein lies part of the challenge. If, if we are to say to all of those in, in the chamber who've not joined a political party that they should do so, and that is a good thing, and we then say to them, it's really, really important that you take part in developing the policy of your party, whichever party that is. And then you slog every night of the week for months before an election to get your preferred candidate of your party elected on the policy that you have helped to determine. And then the proposition is that we should just allow them to vote anyway, regardless of what the party's position is and the membership of the party determined. There's a tension in that. People are always free to stand for election if they want to be independently minded and not be subject to a whip. Uh, and it is up to the culture of different political parties uh, about the extent to which people are allowed to, um, uh, to vote against an issue because of ethical or moral questions. That's an established uh, view across the political parties <laughs> that there are matters of personal conscience that are not the subject of a whip, point one. Point two, often if there's something that has a direct impact on one's constituency, uh, that one um, uh, can be freed from the whip. But the whip is there for a good reason. Um, no doubt it has been abused. I'm not aware of that ever having happened while I was in charge of the, the, the SNP at uh, Westminster. Perhaps it's easier not being in government, I concede. It's perhaps easier being an opposition partner. There are a million reasons why you can vote no to something. It's not the same as having to vote yes to something, and I think we need to be grown up in acknowledging that. But I think at the same time, we need to be honest about going back to my point about politics is still a team undertaking. And take that thought a little bit further if you were to say to all 11 footballers or all 15 rugby players or whichever your, your chosen sport is and just say, go out on the field and play however you want, forget about tactics, the strategy is to win, but just do your best. It's not really gonna work very well. And so I, I'm, I'm trying to explain yes. why things are the way that they are. Um, and if you want to encourage people to get involved in politics, I think the more important thing is, is that your parliamentarians do what the party members vote for. And if you decide what a policy is, that that is what you pursue in parliament. Now, curiously, that in itself is causing huge problems for the Labour Party at the present time. Um, so the theory sounds great, but in practice, sometimes it doesn't work out so well. Catherine, it is good. Jeremy Corbyn famously voted against the Labour Party whip about 500 times. It didn't seem to damage his chances of becoming leader, I think. Well, I think that's well, clearly it's Jeremy's business, not mine. I, I, was the whip of, I was the whip of the European Parliamentary Labour Party. And uh, I have to say, maybe adopting the way that we approached how we whip people uh, would be an example, I think, for us all, where there was more flexibility than certainly the, the kind of stories you hear from Westminster. But I do think there is that balance you have to have when people do have different opinions, how you try and bring that together. And um, we have have this at the moment over a, a, a debate on copyright reform just now in the European Parliament that I'm leading on, but there's different viewpoints. How do we come together? And this comes back to the issue about tolerance. I find just now that people are not tolerant if you have a different perspective or a different viewpoint, and it becomes this tension that then you, 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 don't, you don't have that solidarity that you should have as a group when those tensions exist. And sadly, at the moment, I see that happening more and more. There are, you know, there are, you talked about elections in Sweden. Next year, there's European Parliament elections. And my fearfulness in the European Parliament is you'll have more extremes elected. It'll be more difficult to get consensual decisions in a Parliament where consensus is everything. 
And I think it will be harder to see that, that worth that you have at a European level if we don't get people who can work together. And going back to JP Morgan, that, that's what he could do. He could bring people together. And he did break the web on many occasions himself. Yeah. Yeah. But that didn't harm his reputation. It enhanced it. When he believed in something, he did what was right. And that's what we need, is more people like him in politics today. So, Mona, as the only one not uh, having to follow any whip here, <laughs> I, I know Ming's got a good example he wants to creep in, but uh, Mona, you, you, um, uh, does the answer lie then in uh, improving social media, in rerunning the, the referendum on Europe, uh, in enforcing or loosening the whip in Parliament? I was just thinking, What's as an the academic, it's the one phrase you never use. Can I use the whip? <laughs> you, just, you just, I think you'd get sacked if you wanted to say that. I, I do think, though... Um, just going back to, I was saying, 62% was simply not high enough to make such a conclusive case, in my opinion. And so, therefore, I think we do need to go back to think there is something that's happening in the UK as a whole that I don't think any of the parties has really got to grips with, apart from those who want to use what has happened and what is happening with Brexit as a tool for enormous change, but at the cost of other, society, other people. And I also think that... Um, in some ways what we're facing now is not just a kind of toxic rhetoric on various sides, but actually um, when people say, look, we need to debate this, we need to discuss this, before the debate has even started, people have chosen sides, people have called each other names, people have said, you're against this, you're against that. And I think a lot of people, including a lot of politicians, are actually quite nervous about being part of that debate. So if our politicians themselves are nervous about being part of that debate, where is our democracy going to go? We've talked a lot about the mechanics of democracy today here. For those of us who aren't politicians, we, we're not au fait with how that really works. But we do know as a wider public, what you hear can often be sound bites about things. And if we are not getting to grip with the biggest issue that we're facing in terms of reason debate, which is not necessarily about a second referendum, which is not necessarily about decrying everything that's happening, but actually thinking this is a result that seemingly most people have taken on board. Because one thing that's really challenging for me is why isn't there a more robust counter-narrative to the Brexit? You know, we have enough politicians who are saying that they are Remainers, but we don't have a robust counter-narrative that can challenge it. So what has happened to create this almost chasm? And it's a moral decision. In the end, it's not a political decision. All these decisions are moral decisions. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to end. I'm actually letting Ming have the last word. A sobering reminder of yeah. democracy. Uh, <clears throat> in 2010, the Liberal Democrat Manifesto uh, pledged that there would be no increase in tuition fees. Uh, and I stood on the steps of the Students' Union at St Andrews, uh, uh, university of which I happened to be the Chancellor, and we've had a very distinguished rector, if I may say so, uh, doctor, now, as a result, of, to add to her many other distinctions, and I signed the pledge. I signed the pledge because we were told it was in the manifesto. It was absolutely essential that this was going to ensure that we'd sweep up student votes all over the United Kingdom. And, of course, you all know what happened. In the end, we voted people voted three different ways, voted for, against, and abstained. And it was a clear illustration of what Angus has been pointing to, which is if you stand on a platform and you make a pledge of that kind and you don't fulfill it, then you are deeply, deeply damaged. And the truth is that thereafter, so far as Nick Clegg and the liberal contribution to the uh, coalition government was concerned, it was all seen through this prism of a broken promise. You break your promises, people take, uh, revenge is perhaps too strong a word, but they take the opportunity to remind you that you've done so and shouldn't have done so. And that's one of the reasons why the Liberal Democrats remain in the doldrums at the moment. So democracy is liberal, but it's also brutal. If I may say so, can I <laughs> just say... That's, that's a very good motto for this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can I thank you very much? Thank, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to join me actually in thanking our fantastic panel here. Uh, Baron Campbell of Pitt and Weem, mm. Catherine Styler, MEP, Dr. Professor... Dr. Styler. Doctor. <laughs> Catherine Styler, MEP, Professor Mona Siddiqui and Angus Robertson. Thank you. Thank you.
And I believe we can now all, if you wish to, you can now adjourn to join Charlotte, Ian, Peter uh, and Susan and our hosts in the reception downstairs uh, to, again, look at the, the life and legacy of John P. McIntosh. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening. <laughs>